All right. Good morning. Welcome to Equipping Hour. Come on in. Uh, this morning we have a, a special treat, and I'm going to open us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today, another Sunday to remember an open tomb, forgiven sins, justification for those who believe, eternal life purchased and guaranteed. Lord, we thank you that all of these truths in the gospel give us access to you, the great treasure of the universe. Uh, Lord, we pray as we discuss mental illness this morning and its remedies, we pray that you would be glorified that your ways would be made clear, uh, that there would be hope, uh, that there would be joy, that there would be help here this morning. Uh, we ask for your help in this, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the title of this morning's Equipping Hour is an interview with Jeremy Lehman. Uh, Jeremy needs no introduction here. Uh, you know him. Uh, he has been a tradesman, a missionary, uh, he is a currently a seminary student. He has been a logistics coordinator. He has been an ICBM. And for you Cold War enthusiasts, that has nothing to do with missiles. Uh, his title was Intercontinental Ballistic something. Business manager? I think so. Okay. Uh, and what is your current title? Uh, now I am the COO for Finisterre. So training missionaries in preparation to go over to Papua New Guinea, overseeing administrative things for Finisterre. Uh, which is a joy and a delight. So, and Jeremy is a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a husband to Lori and a dad to those ones over there, Greer Bell Knox. Hey, guys. <laughs> and uh, this morning, we're going to interview Jeremy uh, related to mental illness and psychotropic medications. And so um, this, is, this has the, the advantage of speaking from Jeremy's own experience, uh, melded with the Word of God, and I hope that it is an encouragement to you. And we want to start this morning, Jeremy, just by asking you, how did you become a believer? Yeah. Um, you know, my, my story is similar to a lot of kiddos, even in this church. Uh, born in a Christian home, uh, my dad was a pastor, uh, pastor for 30 plus years, and uh, still involved in ministry. Uh, I was put into every single um, ministry you could for kids, right? So I was in Sparky's, for anybody who remembers what Sparky's are, right? Imagine Jeremy doing Sparky's singing, okay? Um, Awana, whatever the program was, I was involved in those things. In fact, I can't remember a time where I wasn't involved in some type of church body life function. Um, eight years old, um, I had a profession of faith in Christ, and I was terrified of everything out there. So demons, anything spooky, um, you know, anytime I get up in the middle of the night and I had to traverse the hallway and the one hallway that goes out to the living room that's super dark, it was like, I just, I'm gonna have to run past that hallway because I have no idea what's gonna get me when I run past it. So anything out there was terrifying to me. Uh, Halloween night, eight years old, so 1990. And, uh, I, I asked, I asked Christ into my heart, I'm terrified of everything out there. Jesus is going to provide some relief. And I think I understand, I understood sin in some capacity in terms of what it was. I under, understood Jesus was a solution. Uh, I was baptized shortly after that. But my internal life, so a life of deception, was one of rebellion against the Lord. Just a pursuit of every uh, lustful desire that I could in my heart that manifests itself in so many different ways. And the deception that goes along with that to cover those things up. And so internally, I have a conscience that's just killing me. But outwardly, I'm a pastor's kid. And so, you know, man, that guy's got it all together. I mean, that was me. Um, I didn't come to Saving Faith in Christ until my early 20s. And I remember listening to a panel discussion with um, John MacArthur, a couple other guys, and they're working through the book of Ephesians. They're talking about God's sovereignty in salvation. They're talking about predestination. They're talking about election. Um, and I remember MacArthur reading the book of Ephesians. He, just, he reads chapter 2. He starts off with man's condition of rebellion, provides God's solution in but God being rich in mercy uh, with the great love in which he loved us, saved us. And he's talking, and I'm assuming that he's just giving commentary. But I open my Bible, I look down, I'm like, that's actually what it says. And I only viewed myself in the pre-category prior to but God. And so that was... 
Um, I, I had to wrestle through the reality, is that light bulb getting brighter, right? Is that just me growing more in my love for the Lord? Or is that light bulb turning on? And I was just convinced. My life prior to that was patterned by rebellion, deception, all those things. Uh, again, not outwardly, inwardly. Um, and after that, there was a love for God's word, clarity in God's word, a desire to obey God's word. And uh, when I read my Bible, those are the marks of saving faith. And so that was light bulb turning on uh, for me. That's when the Lord saved me. Uh, the rest is history. Eventually made it to Grace Bible Church. You and I are sitting down here. Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> Describe your experience with mental illness. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've had people even this morning, somebody coming up and saying, hey, I have no idea what you're going to talk about this morning. We've known each other for years. Um, and this is this isn't normal conversation where you're walking up like, hey, man, how's your day? What do you do for lunch? And you ever had any foray with uh, psychotropic medication? Like, that's not, it's not a normal conversation. Uh, and so it's not going to come up uh, all the time. Uh, Lori and I were married uh, June 12th, 2004. We are fast approaching our 20, 20th year anniversary. Um, and in October of 2004, went to California, uh, went to a wedding, and got back from that wedding. Had a really sweet time. And we are in our apartment. I am cutting chicken. I'm drinking ruby red squirt, which I will never drink again, okay? There's nothing wrong with it, but I'll never drink it. Uh, and I am holding a knife in my hand. Lori's sitting on the couch. And I have a thought that goes through my mind of killing my wife. I can actually see it just broadcasted in my mind. It wasn't anything that I solicited. It wasn't a thought that I had that I brought into focus in my mind. It was like the idea was just placed into my mind, if that makes sense. And so I didn't really know what to do, apart from trembling, fear, concern. We've been married only a couple months. And so the temptation at that point for me is, how in the world am I going to go talk to my sweet wife? Hey, babe, love you. just want you to know I'm having bizarre thoughts about harming you. And so the very person that I should have gone to uh, in order to say, hey, there's a problem, is the very person that I was avoiding. I, I just, I didn't want to... I didn't want to go to Lori and I didn't want to talk through those things. So I found myself isolating myself from my sweet wife. I go to work, get back at the end of the day, talk briefly, and like, I'm tired and I got to go to bed. And I kept having more amplified thoughts that I wasn't soliciting. And again, the way I would describe it is I'm in a normal conversation and I get blindsided by a thought that is either hypersensual, uh, a thought that is entirely just violent in my thinking, and I'm not upset, I'm not angry, I'm not interacting with anybody in a way where I'm angry. And that was, that was the presenting symptom. I mean, I'd be driving down the road, as an example, in the car, semi-truck next to me, and I'd have a weird thought that would go through my mind, like, man, if I turned the wheel to the left, I mean, that'd be the end. Then I would freak out about having the thought, and I'd say, how could I ever have a thought like that? That is crazy for me to have a thought like that. What's wrong with me? What in the world is going on in my mind? So it was not only the thought that I wasn't soliciting, that I was concerned about, but it moved into the fact that it was how I responded and interacted with the idea that was being put into my mind. And when I say being put into my mind, I don't mean that uh, there's a third party that's intentionally dropping things in my mind. Whatever is happening there, there is an image placed in my mind that I wasn't soliciting, that I'm now having to deal with, and I didn't know how to deal with it. Time goes on. I'm trying to think through what are ways that I can deal with this? What are solutions? You know, I told, I told a family member about it, and some of the solutions I got back, and, you know, with the intention to be helpful, just, they produced no benefit. Continued for quite some time, and as time went on, I remembered eventually being up in Anthem, Arizona, I'm at my parents' house with Lori. That was a place where I just felt, I felt comfortable, if that made sense. I'm home, mom and dad, this is the house I grew up in. I feel comfortable here. I'm in the kitchen, my mom is next to me. Uh, same thing, I'm cutting a steak. And as I'm slicing the steak, I have a thought in my mind of harming my mom, my mom with, this, with the steak knife. Um, and I couldn't tell in that moment if I had actually done it or not. I just let that sink in. 
So at this point, the amount of fear, anxiety, concern that I have, I'm realizing I do not have the resources to be able to deal with what's going through my mind. Zero. I just don't have it. So I put the knife down. My mom made her way outside at this point. Lori, my dad, my mom are outside. I walk out back. Uh, we have an area, there's a pond right there. And I'm like, hey, I need you to take me to the hospital. And my dad just being wise <laughs> as he was, he's like, hey, yeah, let's go. Get into the car, drive to the hospital, uh, made our way to a, uh, a hospital here in the valley. And, uh, and then I was checked in, admitted to the hospital. They immediately put me on suicide watch. So walk in, I've got, a, I got my belt on. They're like, hey, we're gonna need your belt. Um, you know, look down at my shoes, I got shoelaces. Hey, we're gonna need your shoelaces. And so here I am walking to the hospital and I'm navigating two things. One, this is entirely humbling. I'm not even allowed to have shoelaces in my shoes. Uh, I'm not even allowed to have my belt. And so now I'm navigating like, oh no, what have I done? Like now I'm stuck, um, but now I'm committed. You know, and here's my sweet wife, tears. Here's the husband she dreamed of marrying, longing for us just to have this sweet, uh, everything goes well, like lived happily ever after. And uh, she's at a hospital walking me walk, watching me walk through the back door. She leaves from there, she goes home, she's gonna grab me some clothes and things like that that I need. For me, I move into this area where there's a bunch of other people that are dealing with similar things. Door closed behind us, it's locked. But then they also have a refrigerator, ice cream, everything you wanna eat, totally comfortable and laid back. So I meet with a, with a doctor, which I'll get to in just a minute. But then by the time Lori gets back, she's distraught. For me, I've already been given some medicine at that point, and I am relaxed walking around slowly, Lori sees me, I'm eating ice cream, and she's a disaster, and I look like I'm comfortable and this is home. So she doesn't know how to respond with any of that, uh, but here I am. So I am in a behavioral health center at a local hospital, and um, that is my experience stepping into uh, mental illness, mental disorder, however you want to classify it. So what did the doctors tell you? What were your diagnoses? <laughs> uh, what did they tell you you had? Yeah, so I mean, as soon as I walk in, I'm assigned a psychologist uh, who is the doc that is there and just on rotation on that given day. And sits down and just asks me about what am I experiencing? So what in the world are you navigating? Uh, describe the situation that you're experiencing. Um, are you eating? Are you sleeping? Um, just general questions uh, that were asked. Uh, blood work was done at that point as well. So just trying to rule out what is the presenting, there's presenting symptoms that are here, but what are, what are some of the reasons for that? Um, and for me, I'm looking for solutions. So it's just, I have this issue, I don't have answers to any of it. So what in the world do I do? Like just tell me what the problem is so I'm able to, I'm able to step into what's next. How do we resolve it? And so I was classified at that point by the doctor as either being bipolar, if you're using those designations, or as being OCD, so obsessive compulsive disorder. And he leaned on the side of obsessive compulsive disorder, which means I'm um, having these bizarre obsessive thoughts about a particular thing, which is putting me in a state of being mentally out of order, if that makes sense. Um, and so that was his diagnosis. Things, things I didn't know at that point, and, Things I didn't know at that point, I didn't know how to ask good questions of doctors. You know, we'll, we'll get to that later on, but I didn't even know how to ask the right questions. Lab work was done, I'm listening to an individual who, who has good intention. I, I, I never doubted the doctors that were there that they actually wanted to make sure that I was safe, that I was okay, that I could get out of the present crisis I was in in my thinking. Um, I was well cared for uh, when I was in the hospital. That was a safe environment for me with where I was at that particular position or situation. Um, but things just to think about, this is a side note, this is for free, but um, labels are helpful in that they describe symptoms, okay? Um, and just, we do this in everything. Think about even the word Trinity, okay? It's not in the Bible, right? But it's an easy way to define God as he clarifies himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is unique, and that label helps. Imagine walking into Starbucks, and you say, hey, 
I want two shots of espresso, put that into a cup. When that's done, can you froth milk and chocolate, steam it, and then pour that into the cup with the two shots of espresso? That's what I'd like. But it's easier to walk in and say, listen, I'm looking for a grande mocha. That's just what I need. I need a mocha. The ability to have a term to clarify what you're looking for, it's very helpful. The danger is associating yourself with the definition of that symptom. So that term and saying, that's me. It actually just means those are symptoms that, that are being presented. And so the danger is don't get latched on to a definition or a label of something. Uh, they're simply just saying these are the symptoms. So Jeremy, what is the DSM and how does it work? Okay, the DSM uh, is a diagnostics and statistical manual uh, that is used by doctors within the field of psychology and pharmaceuticals related to it. Uh, it's now probably in its fourth or fifth rendition, and it was instituted back 1950s, 1960s, uh, which is a document that was produced that went with the field of medicine under psychology. So if you're looking at an individual that has presenting symptoms related to mental illness, well, then you're going to look at the DSM. That's going to give you a classification of those symptoms. Here's the label that goes with it. That fits in with pharmaceuticals that are associated with that particular uh, label and those symptoms. And so the whole thing fits in the world of medicine. So the DSM is always going to be associated with um, uh, psychology. It's going to be associated with medical diagnosis and statistics for individuals dealing with mental illness. Uh, and I would say mental disorder. Uh, there was a book that was published not too long ago called The Myth of Mental Illness. And uh, the whole premise of the book was when you say illness, it's typically associated with a function that is messed up within the body. If you say disorder, uh, that's a word that's associated with thinking and patterns that are out of a normal order or standard. Uh, and so usually mental disorder is well lean. But So thinking about the world outside of a biblical worldview, yeah. Uh, the world of, of science, um, the world of, of psychology. Um, are they able to observe symptoms and categorize those in a, in a helpful way? Yes. Uh, I would say, I mean, the scientific method is a good thing. Okay. It's a thumbs up. It's a good thing. Uh, if SMED and other pastors <laughs> were not using a method of hermeneutics and biblical study when it came to reading God's word, we would not reap the benefit of those things. In the world of science and looking at symptoms and looking at those things and measuring them, that is helpful. Um, there are things even just related to organic causes of things related to mental illness, where if you're able to look at, hey, this whole group of individuals, we tried putting them on a healthy diet and exercise only, and then you measure the results of that, that's helpful information. So gathering information is a really good thing. And the question is, what do you do with the information that has been gathered? The application of it is different than the gathering of it. If we think of the, the DSM or mm -hmm. using the world's labels for disordered thinking, mm -hmm. um, what's missing is the front end and the back end. The front end is the presuppositions mm -hmm. about what man is, what sin is, who God is. Yeah. That, that whole foundation is missing. Yeah. And then the back end, which is the, so what do we do with it is missing. Mm. So, and, and we'll come back to these themes in, in a bit in your story. No. Um, what then, as, as you were given these labels, mm -hmm. um, which has the potential of creating for you a new identity, mm. um, but they're trying to go with good intentions from problem to solution. What solutions did they come up with? Talk about your introduction to psychotropics. Yeah, Smith, that's a good introduction. So I, I was put on two different psychotropic medications. Uh, first one was called Zyprexa. Uh, the other one was called uh, Clonopin. And so those are going to be their name brands. Uh, generic brands are going to be uh, something different. Uh, but both of them, one of them is for anti-anxiety, uh, which is going to be the Clonopin. And then the other one, Zyprexa, was used as basically an antipsychotic. Um, I was given uh, 10 milligrams, if you guys really want to know, 10 milligrams of Zyprexa and uh, 0.5 milligrams of clonopin. And so these are the drugs that uh, they gave, which, and I will say this, uh, the reality of, they, they did help. You know, I'm going from a state of just concern in my thinking. I don't even know how to interact with myself. I'm put on suicide watch. I immediately moved to where uh, my nerves are calmed. In one sense, I'm tranquilized. 
<laughs> and it, it actually is helping in terms of an immediate issue. Um, I was on Zyprexa for a total of four years. I was on Clonopin for a total of 10 years uh, before I eventually made my way off of those things. Um, I also had to figure out how do I move from the dosage I was given and then wean that dosage to a point where I was able to actually function in society. Uh, I mean, the amount of sleep that I needed as a result of being on psychotropic medication was pretty shocking. Uh, you can just ask Lori afterwards to tell you all about it. Um, there were also just negative effects, negative effects that came from it as well. Um, I remember being a young man with a lot of hair. And, uh, you know, what happened is so much of my hair fell out so fast. Now, the term I would use is shedding. Okay, I think that's a, an appropriate term. And so whatever is in me genetically was amplified uh, to a greater speed as a result of some of that. Don't blame the drugs, Jeremy. <laughs> that is God's plan for your life to join the secret club. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> that's exactly right. Listen, everybody else is envious, and we don't want them to start getting I, on psychotropics. Yeah, no. That's exactly right. Stay away. Um, and so finding the right dosage was one. Uh, symptoms from it also just not helpful. Uh, my goodness. Uh, just difficult even to be able to make my way through those things. Here's some others. Uh, cold sweats uh, and weight gain. Uh, cold sweats were, I remember in the middle of the night at one point, I rolled over in the middle of the night and like I had like, like a puddle of sweat on my back. Um, Lori just was so patient in the midst of all those things, but like my body was reacting to the chemicals that I was putting into it. There was a benefit, but then these are some of the drawbacks that come with it. The other was weight gain. Um, I went from 135 pounds when we got married to 170 in a very short window of time. And I'm 170 right now, but my 170 right now did not look like my 170 uh, back on Zyprexa and the weight gain that came from it. I think some other things too, just I was, I was a dumbed down version of myself. So prior to this, um, very high in terms of just the ability to think logically, solve problems, work, work really well and efficiently, uh, to where my ability to get up in the morning and even just make it through the day was very hard, incredibly dumbed down. My ability even to interact well was, was just diminished. Uh, I wanted to sleep all the time. Uh, ambition, gone. Just zero ambition in terms of a desire to do much of anything as a result of those things. Uh, and I could just, you mind if I read something out of anatomy of an epidemic? Yeah, let's, uh, let's transition to that. Um, I've got a uh, resource here. It's called Anatomy of an Epidemic. Jeremy's holding it too. We didn't talk about this. We both brought it. Uh, this is <laughs> no. not a, a Christian book. It mm. doesn't come from a biblical worldview. Uh, but what it does is trace the history of mental illness and psychotropic medication um, from, a, from a worldly perspective. But it's actually really helpful. One of the things that it does is trace the philosophy of mental illness, where the, the whole study went from the realm of the soft sciences to be brought under the umbrella of what are the hard sciences. And, and what I mean by that, sociology, psychology, those were all historically considered the soft sciences. They're, they deal with the realms of observations and observations that are given from personal testimony rather than objectifiable things, uh, blood work, um, laboratory work, getting into the microscope and seeing hard science data. And, and the, the desire, I'll, I'll speak of the, the de amorphic desire of, of an industry. Um, it's hard to pin this down to, to one person in lo one location. Um, but the, the desire of the industry was to bring the soft sciences under the banner of the hard sciences so people have the impression, yes, scientists say, therefore this is truth. And if you think about the, just the realm of epistemology, that's how we know what we know, and truth claims and credibility. If somebody has a white laboratory coat on and a stethoscope around his neck, and he's got reams of paper with data and information, it carries a weight of credibility. And it was a weight of credibility that psychology did not enjoy and desperately wanted to enjoy. And and what's in league with that is we've got help for these hard scientific analyses 
that are demonstrating problems. Now, we just talked about the DSM, and we're talking about the ability of people to say, hey, what's your problem? State the problem. Uh, let me give you a label for that. You're really suffering. All of that's well and good. But without asking the question, why are you suffering, and then coming to wrong conclusions about what do we do about it, the scientists could actually give help that changed behavior. And what does that do for the credibility? Everybody goes, science works, but we haven't actually done science. So anyway, anatomy of an epidemic sort of traces the history of that. And so while, while not coming from a biblical worldview, it's sort of an insider's expose of the industry. And there are many like this. It's not the only one out there. Um, but um, Jeremy and I have both read this, but you got to read this from the vantage point of your own perspective. Um, and I think you have something you want to read from it. So go. Yeah, uh, that's a great, great, introdu great introduction on the book. And, and I would say, just even adding to that, this book traces years of statistical data, not months of statistical data. So if you want to look at use of psychotropic drugs or placebo effect, where you're not actually taking it, but you think you are, uh, for a 15-year period, you get to actually see a real data in terms of how that impacts people. So the book not only gives you just a short view of it, it gives you a long-term perspective of its use. Uh, this is something I just wanted to say in terms of just drugs generally. I think it was talking about feeling dumbed down with things that I was on. And this also moves into even thinking about wanting to eventually get off or wean down on medication that may be prescribed to somebody in a similar situation. This is just the dumbing down effect. So just, just listen to this. It also impacts memory. Uh, this is a quote from a guy named David Knopp, physician at the University of Tennessee. Uh, he said this in 1976, quote, I am very convinced that Valium, Librium, and other drugs of that class cause damage to the brain. I've seen damage to the cerebral cortex that I believe is due to the use of these drugs, and I'm beginning to wonder if the damage is permanent, end quote. Another quote. In 2004, a group of Australian scientists, after reviewing the relevant literature, concluded that, quote, long-term benzo, which is a classification of drug that I was taking, benzo users were consistently more impaired than controls across cognitive categories, end quote, with these deficit, quote, moderate to large in magnitude. Listen to this. This is 1983, World Health Organization noted a, quote, striking deterioration in personal care and social interactions, end quote, in long-term benzo users. Now look at this. So that is, you've got one classification in terms of cognitive function, memory, uh, interaction in society. I mean, it's measured. I mean, these are coming from individuals who are noted individuals. But then this is the trap that is associated with, with so many psychotropic drugs. Uh, this is on page 139 in the book. It says this. It says, the scientific literature reveals that benzodiazepines, much as neuroleptics do, act like a trap. The drugs ameliorate or satisfy or calm down anxiety for a short period of time, and thus they can provide a distressed person much needed relief. However, they work by perturbing the neurotransmitter system, and in response, the brain undergoes compensatory adaptations. And as a result of this change, the person becomes vulnerable to relapse upon drug withdrawal. So that difficulty in turn may lead some to take the drugs indefinitely. And these patients are likely to become more, listen, anxious, more depressed, and cognitively impaired. So you end up with a drug that goes from... This is going to help. And guess what? It does initially because your body is trying to figure out what do I do with this foreign thing that's now been put into my system? God's designed our bodies in a way where it's able to adapt to even a foreign body like that. Well, guess what? It adapts and then that becomes the new normal. So then if you decide to go off of the drug or wean from it, you have to again adapt to go back to the new normal. And that creates more difficulty when you try to get off the drug. So what is typically communicated is... Um, you have a chemical imbalance in your system. What is proven now scientifically is there is no chemical imbalance. The drug creates a chemical imbalance, and you have to work hard to get away from the chemical imbalance. Uh, that is proven in journals uh, within the scientific community and within this book. 
So just, it is a trap. It's a help. It's short term, but it is a trap. It makes it hard to get out of them. So you talked about dumbing things down. Uh We're going to dumb things down for me for a second. Great. (laughs) We really need Jake Hantla here to describe neural pathways and Uh synapse function. Yep. um, In terms of the way your brain produces chemicals to get neurons to fire Mm -hmm. across neural, uh, across synapse. Those are gaps. Mm -hmm. um, And uh, chemicals work between these gaps and create neural pathways for thought. It's really fascinating the way the human brain works like a supercomputer, better than any supercomputer. Um, and it is organic. It, it, it's not bits and pieces of metal. It's, it's tissue and it's harmable. And um, again, someday we need Jake just to describe this for us, put slides up on the screen and, and detail for us what's happening. But drugs do have an effect that ameliorates symptoms. They make you feel better. They make you less anxious. They make you happier. They make you want to eat ice cream in comfortable clothes and be calm. It's Um, true. (laughs) (laughs) But if you trace the history of psychotropic medication, you recognize that the, the drugs keep changing. You actually have already traced the history of psychotropic medication without reading this book. How do I know that? Because you've watched television. Mm. you've seen sporting events and you see the advertisements and it's not the same advertisement for the last 70 years. It's different. And the drugs are always different. Mm. Um, and, and there's a lot of things you can read that will go super dark, cynical, conspiratorial that says, follow the money. Um, there's probably something to that. There is an industry built around repeat customers that need a product the real tragedy for the human situation um, is that there is help to be had that has to back up the train. Instead of affecting those neural pathways with chemicals, that then your brain really remarkably by God's design overcomes the interference that you've just done with a chemical. It, It rewrites the system, compensates for the chemicals you put in with its own sets of chemicals, and therefore makes you need another one to accomplish the same thing. But you haven't addressed the fundamental issue underneath. Mm -hmm. And so um, we just need to rethink the whole process of this. And and Jeremy, what I want to ask you is is a really dumbed down question. Mm -hmm. Um, We know for a fact that anxiety, depression, obsessive behavior and suicidal ideation are products of the 20th century. Hmm. Or do we? What is ideation? I don't know. Okay. Thinking about stuff. It's good. I like it. Okay. Um, Are these things new? (laughs) Does the Bible address them? The Bible addresses all of them, uh, which is really just, you know, how, how do you, how do you backfill truth as you're thinking about psychotropic medication coming off of psychotropic medication, and and I'll leave with this. Anytime I have talked with somebody, counseled somebody uh, in this domain, I have never told them, hey, you need to get off your medication. I've never led with that. Uh, That is a conclusion that you want the individual to come to on their own, uh, in their own time, and you're gonna be leading them to understand that God's word fully supplies them uh, if they are a believer with everything they need to change in their thinking. Um, I have counseled individuals to reduce their medication so they can get to a certain point cognitively where they're able to think rationally. They're able to navigate what's going on in their mind. They're able to hear God's word with clarity. They're able to sit down with somebody and have a real conversation. That needs to happen. And so that's reduction of medication, not removal of. And so always starting at that place. I think um, another item is just understanding your state of spiritual maturity. You, you need to know where you are presently before you move in to, to moving away from psychotropic medication. So let's say an individual says, I, I want to be off psychotropic drugs. That's great. Where are you at right now with practicing uh, just biblical principles to dependence upon the Lord, growing in a love for his word and applying his word in your life in the areas that you have right now that aren't associated with that? If there's immaturity there, that individual, when they move into this state where they're trying to move away from psychotropic medication, that's only going to be amplified. 
And so if you're not strong now, you're not going to be strong in the midst of that trial that's going to be even more difficult. Uh, here's, a, here's just a, an example. Turn, turn over, if you've got your Bibles, just turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. And look at verse 11. Of course, I need to find it too. And make sure that I'm at the right place. Here we go. Make our way down. So we're going to go to verse 14, but we'll start at 11 and make our way down. It says, And he himself gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So here is God giving pastor teachers so that the body would be equipped. So believers are equipped for the work of service for ministry. Verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the full knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, why? This answers the question, why is it we have to be spiritually mature? Verse 14, so that we are no longer to be children. Well, what are children defined by? Tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ. A believer has to be mature. Um, this is just obvious for children. Uh, if we're thinking like a child, we are tossed around by any type of wind of doctrine. Here, that's just, doctrine is just a, a body of teaching. It's a belief system. And so if you're in a state where you are tossed around back and forth, uh, you're not convinced, you don't have solid conviction on what you know, you're going to move yourself into a state where you are going to deal with a trial and pressure and hardship that you will not be able to sustain. And so there's a need for spiritual maturity. That would be the first. Uh, just thinking through that. I've got more, but... I just, I don't want to, I don't want to leave Ephesians 4 yet okay. because this is so critical. This picture of the church, yeah. you've got shepherds in the local church, yep. you have truth in love, mm -hmm. you have discernment, yep. you have the goal being maturity measured by the stature of Christ, yep. and you have the one another's. Mm -hmm. You have the, the body of Christ building up the body of Christ. Yep. If, if someone is anxious and not on psychotropics, what do they need? Yeah. What you just said. They need all of it. And yeah. if you're under the trial of, hey, I'm in the system, mm -hmm. um, what do they need? First need, if I hear you right, is not get off drugs. Mm. First yeah. need is what Ephesians 4 says. Yeah, maturity. All right, Growing keep going. Up. <laughs> yeah. So that's Ephesians. Here's, here's another I want you guys to move over to. Just make your way over to 2 Timothy 3, uh, 16 through 17. Uh, these are texts that are familiar to a believer uh, who has been at Grace Bible Church or you have been underneath faithful, faithful preaching, faithful teaching, faithful discipleship. Uh, but these are texts that we know and love. Look at this in verse 16, chapter 3, 2 Timothy. All Scripture is breathed out and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Verse 17, purpose statement. Why? For this purpose, so that the man of God may be equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is, this is a picture of God giving everything that is needed to a believer. In other words, the other way to ask it would be like this. Did God not have the right prescription or remedy for issues related to mental illness, issues related to mental disorder? If you say yes, then you're denying the fact that God supplied you with everything that you need. God could have said, through the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, he could have said, listen, when there's mental issues, alcohol is the solution. It's what God has provided. He doesn't say any of that. 
He communicates that you have everything that you need, everything, lacking nothing. Verse 14 is helpful as we think about verse 16 and 17. Just look up to verse 14. Paul is writing to Timothy, and here's, here's the point where we need to think through God's word is objectively true and useful in every single situation we would find ourselves in. But 14 is helpful. Just apply to Timothy. Look at this, verse 14. But you, this is Timothy, continue in the things you learned and became convinced of, knowing from who you learned them. Oftentimes we are able to read our Bible, memorize scripture, but not be convinced that this is the solution God has given for everything. He's the one that's defined it. Our responsibility is to be convinced of that truth, conviction on those things. Conviction is never measured based on what you know and what you can communicate. Conviction is measured based on your practice of those things that you know. And so you have to be convinced. You can't just look at 16 and 17. That's true. No, convinced. And then walk in those things. Somebody has to walk alongside an individual in the midst of this process. But God has not been lacking in what he's supplied us with for that change. Thank you, Jeremy. It's uh, really, really helpful to see the word of God's declaration of its own sufficiency for human problems. Yeah. But come on. Does, <laughs> does the Bible really address the specifics mm. that, that modern psychology addresses? And I have to go back about 25 years of my own life uh, thinking back to the way I, I thought at one time. And, and Janet and I were dating. She was studying biblical counseling. And, and the questions that were coming up, yeah, but does the Bible actually address the 16-year-old the girl who's cutting herself? Mm. Or d does it actually address anorexia or depression or yeah. these kinds of things? Mm. Um, the, the, the statement that Scripture is breathed out by God and, and profitable and it's all we need, mm -hmm. um, that's a creedal statement. Yep. But does it actually have feet? It does. And, and there's, there's a couple places you could go. Turn over to Second Peter. Uh, chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse 2, verse 3. And something else that is just helpful to look at here in Second uh, Peter, especially in chapter 1, he, he has this reoccurring theme he keeps coming back to. Now, talking about the full knowledge of God, uh, back into three, we'll read it in a minute. The full knowledge of him, uh, come down to verse six, in your knowledge, um, come down to verse eight, the full knowledge of the Lord. Now, there's just this, you need to actually know who God is. But look at verse two and then to three. It says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the full knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse three, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the full knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So does a believer lack anything that has to do with living life in a way that pleases the Lord in our thinking and all those things? Does he supply us with something that is that's lacking? Or what do, are we missing something? Peter's convinced, and this is the back end of Peter's life. I mean, death comes to him shortly after he writes this epistle, and he is convinced. He has shepherded who knows how many different things. He has suffered trials and hardship. He is encouraging individuals with his last moments of his life, and he says, God has granted to us everything. Um, even studying and looking at, you uh, think of the Hippocratic Oath. I don't know if you guys have ever heard the Hippocratic Oath in the medical world. Every doctor has to stand and declare the Hippocratic Oath before they become a doctor, which goes back to a guy named Hippoc Hippocrates, Hippo, Hippo something, you know, whatever. Smed, Smed will clarify it afterward. But even back then, he, they had methodologies that they employed for individuals that had issues related to mental illness or mental health, whatever those things were. Again, God hasn't prescribed those things. He has prescribed his word, and the spirit of God living in a believer is sufficient. Um, I don't know if that's what you were aiming at. That's great, but. Jeremy. Um, what are some resources? Because this, this issue of if I'm in a, if I'm in a trial where I'm... I know I need help with my thinking, hmm. or I'm in the trial that I got help from my thinking, but I, it might be counterproductive. What do I do? And, 
and this is so critical, and, and I love hearing Jerry's, Jeremy's testimony on this, of, of backfilling with truth, mm. no matter what state you're in. So, Jeremy, I want to ask you, what resources have you found helpful? Um, obviously, passage after passage after passage, we'll just, mm-hmm. the Word of God is the foundational resource, but what other things have you found helpful yeah. for filling your mind with truth, dealing with disordered thinking? Yeah, I mean, a direct application, like a resource, uh, maybe is what you're thinking. Um, Texts in Scripture are always going to be the thing that I go back to, <laughs> but um, I will look at some resources really quickly. One of the things that was really helpful to me um, initially was something called Safe in the, so- in the Storm. Uh, I'm looking this up just because so much is in here. If you go to a website called biblicalstrategies.com, Uh, There are so many resources there specific to issues that individuals face as believers. Uh, Safe in the Storm is dealing with things like anxiety, fear of the future, concern, and all of those things. Not only did you have excellent pastoral counsel being given in a very brief resource, but it also came with cards that you would pull out and open, okay? And it was lies that I can be tempted to believe, that's on one side, and then flip it over, and here's the text, the truth I need to remind myself of. Uh, Often when you're in the midst of a situation like this, if you are growing in your maturity, you don't know where to go in the Bible. You don't know where to open up scripture and go to it. You you just need, like, I just need to know how to think. Uh, And so that was an excellent resource, uh, being able to actually look at what is the lie I can be led to believe and what is the truth that I need to put on. Um, All throughout scripture, we're looking at, well, all throughout scripture, but even just looking at the New Testament, book of Ephesians and Colossians, God's remedy to mental disorder is to think the thoughts of God and to think rightly, putting off wrong thinking, putting on right thinking. Um, and that is not a process that happens very quickly. There, there, there is a, uh, there's a false notion that I can find myself moving into and believers can find themselves falling into that if I pray to the Lord, he's going to magically answer that. I don't have to do any hard work so that I'll move to a state where he actually is providing me with comfort and peace in the way that's needed. Um, Galatians 6, 9 says, just let us not lose hope, right? It, it's the press on in these things. Over a duration of time, that growth spiritually moves to where you do have conviction and confidence. But biblical strategies is one that was very helpful. Um, another is going to be Lloyd-Jones on spiritual depression, which I have here, and I have a quote I'd love to read. If you're good with that. Okay, here's another book, Lloyd-Jones, Spiritual Depression. If you haven't got this, get it. And full admission, I have not read the book. (laughs) But what I have read is the introduction. And if you only are able to read the introduction, it is the entire book shrunk down into a couple statements. Listen to this. How must we reconcile the two things? He's talking about the psalmist saying, my soul, why are you downcast? Hope in God. It's this psalm where you look at the psalmist and he's speaking to no one other than himself, right? So he says, how do you reconcile these two things? He says, in this way, I say we must talk to ourselves instead of allowing ourselves to talk to us. Do you realize what that means? I suggest that the main trouble in this whole matter of spiritual depression in a sense is this, that we allow ourselves to talk to us instead of talking from ourself or talking to ourself. He said, I'm not trying to be paradoxical. He says this, have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Take those thoughts that come to you the moment you wake up in the morning. You have not originated them, but they start talking to you. They bring back the problems of yesterday, etc. Somebody is talking. Who is talking to you? Yourself is talking to you. It says, now this man's treatment was this. Instead of allowing this self to talk to him, he starts talking to himself. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? He asks. His soul had been depressing him, crushing him. So he stands up and he says, self, listen for a moment. I will speak to you says, do you know what I mean? If you do not, you have had little experience in this matter. The main art in the matter of spiritual living is to know how to handle yourself. You have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, 
question yourself. You must be able to say to your soul, why are you cast down? What business have you to be disquieted? Uh, this, is, this is the matter of it. He says in the end here, the essence of this matter is to understand that this self of ours, this other man within us has got to be handled. Do not listen to him. Turn on him, speak to him, condemn him, unbraid him, exhort him, encourage him, remind him of what you know. Instead of listening placidly to him and allowing him to drag you down and depress you. It's wonderful. Jeremy, I think about uh, 2 Corinthians 1 and Paul describing experiences of excessive sorrow. And he said, we despaired even of life. And this is the Apostle Paul who gives some of the remedies that you just described. Yeah. And, and what strikes me in that is that Christians face these things. They're, they're not new. They're not universal. I mean, they are universal. Um, they are not to be isolating. But if we get a, a diagnosis, uh, a scientific label, mm. a, a new identity, and then the, the prescribed remedies, we can feel alone and there's something wrong with us mm. that others don't experience. Yeah. And th this whole discussion is really helpful, I think, in one sense, to normalize disordered thinking. Mm. All of us are under the command of Romans 12 too, to renew your mind by the power of the Spirit, using the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, we are to think God's thoughts after Him. And as you were doing that, Jeremy, and, and on psychotropic medication, did you drop them like a rock? Did you go cold turkey? What did you do? No, uh, that was a, it was a slow process. I mean, for the longest time, uh, I just stayed on them, but I knew that they were not the solution. Uh, in fact, I, I'd meet with my psychologist and he would only ask me three questions. Are you eating? Are you sleeping? Are you having strange thoughts? And if it was a yes, yes, no, then it was great. Here's your prescription. I'll see you in a month. If it was yes, 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 resulting conversation, and we would look at medication if it needed to be adjusted. And that was it. I mean, that went on for months. And I am just internally done uh, with the conversation. And so I started seeking out what does counsel look like, coupling counsel with a doctor, um, being the one that's helping when it comes to issuing out medication. But that was a slow process. And um, four years on Zyprexa, 10 years on the other. Um, but it was not, it was not cold turkey. It was measured. It was slow, understood the consequences ahead of time, knew what I was going to step into, and then dealing with the issues when they presented themselves. And, and just remind us why cold turkey is a potential danger. Oh my goodness. Well, remember what we, we already talked about with the fact that your body adjusts to the new normal, right? And so you have to help your body move back to the new normal if you're going to go off of those drugs. And just by the very nature of how those drugs, those chemicals interact with your neural pathways, your body has to restructure, reframe. Well, rather than a, hey, my bone is healing and now it's been realigned and it's in a cast, you're dealing with your thinking. Your thinking has to be realigned, which means you're going to be hyper anxious. Your mood swings are going to be crazy. You're going to be angry. Uh, you're, going to, you're going to have thoughts that you never thought you would have while you're trying to make your way off the medication. You need support in the midst of that. Uh, and you should not move into moving away from drugs, cold turkey, unless you have an incredible support system that most people don't. Now, that's why it's medically not advised. Doctors will advise you, hey, let's do this slowly. I want to help you in this process. Uh, I've never interacted with a doctor and said, oh, yeah, go, go cold turkey. They know uh, the fact that your brain has to be rewired again when you come off of these drugs. In the olden days, the pastor, the pastoral office, uh, had the alternate title of doctor of the soul. And the Greek word for soul is psukos, where we get our word psychology. Uh, and so it's interesting that the scientific world has taken over an older label for pastors, and, and they are now the doctors of the soul, as it were. Um, how important, if, if someone were in your shoes, who should they be talking to? Where would you direct them? If, if they are starting to wonder, is, is a lifelong pathway of diagnosis, remedy, diagnosis, remedy, uh, where I want to be or not, who should I be talking to? Well, you'd want to be talking to multiple people. Um, 
one, you need to have a doctor that knows you and a doctor that you trust. Uh, you need to be able to have a conversation where you can communicate back and forth with clarity. Uh, two, you need to have biblical counsel. It's going to come from individuals that know God's word, love God's word, and know you. Um, and and there, is a, there is a danger. There are people that will say things related to biblical counseling. Like, oh, whatever. They just say, memorize these verses and go about your happy day. And that, that's not biblical counseling. Biblical counseling is, hey, have you met with the doctor? When was the last time you got blood work? Tell me about your sleeping patterns. Tell me about your eating. How's your eating going? Are you taking any stimulants, coffee, uh, soda, uh, chocolate? Um, so it, it, that individuals that are doing really well at biblical counseling, they're thinking through a full spectrum of issues and wanting to care for your soul. And so be around your elders, your shepherds. Ask them for your help. They want to help you. The temptation in all of this is the same temptation that hits everybody else. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is clear. No temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. He will provide the way of escape in the midst of those things. But the temptation is to say, I want to come off these drugs. I don't want anybody to know that I'm even on them. I don't know what they're going to think about it. Nobody else deals with this. It's only me. That's a lie. That's a lie. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is there as a reminder that this is common. And so there's a need to go to the individuals that actually have a care for your soul, biblically mandated, uh, individuals that will bear an account before the Lord for the way that they shepherd. And so just there are so many resources that are available now from a biblical perspective uh, that weren't, even if you just go back a couple decades. Uh, this is something that has really been championed um, by guys like Jay Adams in a, in a very long period of time and developed by men that have turned it into the resources we have now to be able to think biblically about these things and think well. If, if you're not on psychotropics and you think you're hearing from us the message, don't do drugs, you're correct. That's what we're saying. <laughs> if you're on psychotropic medication now and you think you're hearing from us, stop it. That's not what we're saying. Mm. Is that clear? I want to make that abundantly clear. Yeah. Um, and, and if you're in that realm, if you're in that system, um, reach out. Reach out to the shepherds in this church. Talk to Jeremy. There are lots of resources. You're not alone. You're not the only one dealing and struggling and wrestling and fighting. Mm. Um, and, and as Jeremy said, that's one of the great lies. Sin loves to isolate. Mm. Difficulty loves to isolate. Trials love to isolate. Despair definitely loves to isolate its victims. Mm. And so reach out, get help. Talk to believers who love God's word. Um, and, and you won't be steered away from science. Mm -hmm. The reality is um, you need to understand science the way God has designed the human anatomy and physiology from a biblical understanding of the presuppositions of what is man. That's the great thing that the, the soft sciences have left out. And so they can't get to the real remedies, the lasting remedies, the, the truth. And so, um, Jeremy, one last thing. If you were a parent and you had a child with behavioral difficulty and teachers and counselors and doctors saying, here, prescribe this, we'll prescribe this to your kid and all your parenting issues will get better. Mm. What would you say? Uh, I would say slow down and, and don't make any decisions too quickly on those things. Uh, I, I would even say culturally, uh, it is quote in, uh, to uh, have your meds if you are a kiddo that is in school these days. So there is a cultural flavor that is there in terms of this is just how we deal with this. Um, slow down, get counsel, think through those things. There, there are things associated to just being a kid that are part of just being a kid. And uh, sometimes things like ADHD and things that are associated with kids that are hyperactive. Uh, listen, I'd rather have a very hyperactive, crazy kid that can be directed with all that energy in the direction they need to move um, through parenting, counsel, shepherding, discipline, etc. Rather than just, this is, this is just a lot of problems here. I don't even know how to manage this. I don't even know how to think about this. I trust this doctor, and I'm just going to go ahead and do this. Slow down. Ask questions meet with shepherds, interact with people, and just have them help you think through parenting. Sometimes your kids have just got a, a horrible case of normal, and that's just the way parenting goes. 
And so you need to think through, is this a horrible case of normal or is this crazy? Um, and so just slow down. Uh, there are so many people in here that want to be able to help and give good counsel. And so don't step away from the counsel that's around you. Thank you, Jeremy. Would you close us in prayer? Yeah, let's do that. Heavenly Father, God, I praise you for, uh, Lord, just your grace. And what a joy to know that sin is forever done away with uh, for those that have faith in you uh, through your son, Jesus Christ. Christ accomplished our, our greatest need, um, and he accomplished it on the cross. Uh, sin and death entirely separate man from you. And Jesus, in his wonderful sacrifice on the cross, has dealt with that issue. Peace is only possible through his blood. And so I praise you, Lord, that the gospel saves an individual from ever having to deal with the consequence of their sin in the court in heaven, always being with the Lord. And the gospel also sanctifies believers so that we are equipped with everything that we need in order to live life, not only in a way that is um, excellent, but in a way, Lord, that brings honor and glory to you. There is a way for us to conduct ourselves, uh, Lord, that is able to allow things to run smoothly. But God, we want to live in a way that brings glory to you. And so I pray, Lord, that we would be able to those, be those that do that and do it well. I well, thank you for your grace. I pray with those that are, or pray for those that are navigating even issues related to mental health. Uh, Lord, that you would comfort them, allow them to reach out to individuals uh, that would be able to help them. And I thank you for this time this morning. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeremy.